Okay, hello. Thanks for coming. I'm Steve Goldman, director of the John H. Snyder Center for Free Enterprise, and want to welcome you all, and thank you for coming. I want to thank John Schneider and the Charles C. Koch Foundation for funding the Schneider Center and funding all these events. Uh, as I say at every one of these sessions, if you're not an economics major, you should consider it. You can do a BA or a BS, so you can do an arts and science degree and get an economics degree, or you can do a business degree and e get an economics degree. And you can do co-majors and all those other great things. And you get really high paying jobs, so that might be a benefit. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about upcoming events. Our next event will be in January, January 25th at 4.30. We're going to have John Allison. He's the ex-CEO of BB&T and ex-president of Cato Institute. And he will be here to talk about the economy and, and other things, I guess. And I do want to announce that next semester, there's going to be two reading groups and, and a weekend reading group. We're having a Monday night reading group, a Tuesday night reading group, in a weekend reading group. The Monday and Tuesday night reading groups will meet for three nights. We're going to read three books each. And the weekend reading group is a full weekend. It's a full, all day Friday, all day Saturday. We uh, re will do some readings, discuss them for a couple hours, eat really good food, probably go to ceviche one night and eider down one night for dinner, um, good lunches and um, breakfast. So if you're interested, you should sign up. There'll probably be some emails going out to um, business school majors if you're not. Come up and talk to me afterwards or send me an email and I'll send you a form to sign up. They're really fun. Most students like them. Um, all right. So this whole semester we've been examining communism to capitalism in, in, in Asia. We started with Yan Mi Park and her horrible story of North Korea and, and escape into um, human trafficking in China. And finally she got here to America and she is going to get married in, in January 1st, so she's real excited about that at Columbia, so, so good for her. And then we had Frank Dakota came in and talked about Mao's China and all the atrocious things that Mao did to people. When you have big government controlling everything, these, these things can happen. It's pretty frightening. Um, so socialistic governments usually make people worse off, not better off, even though it sounds, sounds good in theory. Um, although China is still a communist country, today people are freer than they've ever been since Mao took control of China. And this, this freedom that they've gotten, because China's become more capitalistic, has allowed them to flourish and be better off. And they're much better off today than they were in the past. Still not great, there's still a billion people in poverty. Out of 1.6 billion, there's 600 million people that are doing really well. Huge income distribution, but people are moving up instead of down. So this, I would argue this is a good thing. And this happens when government doesn't lim limit individual freedoms. Economic freedom may be the most important freedom for prosperity and growth, and China has become more economically free. So today we're going to hear about how capitalists became, how, excuse me, how China became capitalistic. And our speaker is Dr. Ning Wang. He grew up in Hubei, China in the 1970s and was educated at Beijing University and the University of Chicago. He's mainly interested in new institutional economics and China's e political economy. He's written extensively on China's transition to a market economy and open society. He's a senior fellow, fellow at the Ronald Coase Institute, editor of Man and the Economy, the Journal of the Coase Society. He's also the international director of the Ronald Coase Center for the Study of Economy at Zhejiang University and adjunct professor of law and economics at Shanghai. Shanghai Jiao Tong University, an honorary fellow at the Ronald Coase Center for Property Rights and Research at the University of Hong Kong. He's lectured extensively in China in, on academic policy and business communities, and both inside and outside China, he's talked about China. He was Franco Foreman Lecturer at Institute Bruno Leone in Italy, Visiting Fellow at the University of Chicago Law School and Visiting Research Fellow at the Institute of the Developing Economies in Chiba, Japan. He wrote the book that he's going to talk about today with the late Nobel laureate Ronald Coase. And the book's How China Became Capitalistic and it's now available in eight languages. You can get it in English also. He's um, 
Um, this book was all, it won the 2012 Arthur Seldon Award for Excellence from the Institute of Economic Affairs in London, the 2013 Anthony Fischel Inter International Memorial Award from the Atlas Economic Research Foundation. The Chinese translation won China's Best Book Award and several other book awards in China. So I want to welcome Ning Wang and thank him for being here. Thank you. Great pleasure to be here and just uh, I had a chance to walk around the campus to remind me so much of the fourth season in uh, Hyde Park, Chicago. Uh, now living in uh, uh, California, uh, this, I don't know, first time coming back to Midwest, well, now you, but Midwest and the South, kind of. Um, particularly, I'm very moved to hear that, you know, some students coming, taking four hours to come, to come here. Welcome students, you know, coming outside the, the campus and, uh, and other, you know, friends coming out of this campus. Um, today I'm going to share with you some thoughts I have about how China became capitalist. Uh, the economic rise of China is a big event. It's not just a story about China, uh, it's a story of our time. This is a phrase I've seen uh, in 2008 at the 30th anniversary of the Chinese economic reform. Time magazine put out an article saying that you know, economic transformation in China is a story of our time. I think this is absolutely true. Uh, even though this process is still ongoing today, as we speak. Uh, so, I assume some, many of you have heard some versions of this story, how China became capitalist. Uh, given the, if you read New York Times, the story says, uh, I'm going to, Yeah, this is the slides I want to, to show you now. That's the reason why I don't use PowerPoint in my lectures and in my talk. Uh, but two reasons I, I, I decided to use PowerPoint. One, when I heard that there are going to be a lot of people in the audience, like 100, 200 in the audience, I decided better to use PowerPoint. Another reason, of course, I'm not a native speaker, as you can tell, so better give you some visual guide, I hope not rather than as distraction. Um, the most common reading of how China became capitalist, if we simplify in two words, that is state of capitalism. I assume you have heard that term or have seen that term somewhere. Uh, so I, here I have a number of uh, examples from The Economist, Atlantic, Business Week, and uh, Reuters. Uh, two from England, two from here, basically the same, the same message. China be able to uh, become what it is today is due to state of capitalism. Uh, uh, and this idea is easy to sell, particularly because China is still run by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, you compare, and this is the only transition economist, you know, comparing China with Russia and other, you know, Eastern, Eastern European, you know, uh, emerging markets. That's the only country still run by the Communist Party. In other places, other transition economies, the Communist Party disappeared. So the party is still there, and actually the party is becoming stronger. Uh, a lot of, you know, you can, use a lot of indicators to say the Communist Party has become stronger in China today than it was 30, 40 years ago before reform. Uh, so people somehow just make that connection to say that it's the, you know, Beijing government did all it took, whatever it took to make China, uh, you know, in the second largest economy in the whole world. Uh, well, if you have that, that, that pre-perception, I'm trying to change your idea, change your view of how China became capitalist. Uh, if you don't have that pre-perception, 
Now I would have an easy job to sell my ideas. Uh, so let's start from the very beginning. Uh, so my talk going to draw primarily from, from the book I did with, with Professor Coase, uh, How China Became Capitalist. The book came out in 2012, and that's the Chinese translation, uh, came out uh, 2013, and also available in some other languages. Uh, Basically, I'm going to address three questions, okay? The number one, how did China do it? How did it happen? How China became capitalist? The second question, what is unique about capitalism Chinese style, so to speak? What is the defect, particularly, I'm going to talk about the defect. What's wrong with the current Chinese market economy? Uh, the third, what general lessons can we learn from China? As, as, as you know, uh, the, the Time Magazine article said, this is a, a story, great story of our time. So this is not just a lesson for China or for, for Asia, but for, for us all. Uh, there's one point I want to emphasize. Uh, if, I, if we have people from, if we have students from anthropology, you, you probably know better than I do, but I think sometimes we tend to forget that we all are descendants of a small group of people that migrated from Africa about 70,000 years ago. Okay? We may come from different races, different countries, different passports, different religions, so on and so forth. But we are coming from that one band of group that 70,000 years ago uh, that migrated from, from Africa. Keep that in mind. Okay, I think this is a, so I wanted to draw some general lessons from the Chinese uh, market, Chinese experience of market transformation. Before going into details about the three, to address the three questions, I just want to show you, give you some visual uh, 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 clue what happened in China. If you have been to China before, say in the 80s, 90s, and uh, recently, you see what happened in China. Let, 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 give me a hand. How many of you have been to China in the past like five years? Okay, only, only a few, only a few. Um, so let me show you uh, a few pictures about one particular place, Shenzhen. If you, you probably this name you first time to hear, this is a big city in China today. It is probably second, third largest in terms of population. Uh, but it was a fishing village by the end of 1970s. So I'm going to show you some photos about this place, Shenzhen. So this is Shenzhen 1980. This is Shenzhen 2011. OK? This is Shenzhen today. It's in 1980. That's, that's, that's the difference. That's what happened, what transformed in China. And then I'm going to give you a personal experience, what happened. I grew up, in, in, uh, as Steve said, in, in Hubei, China, uh, 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 a village in, in Hubei. So I'm going to share with you my experience, how China had what the Chinese market transformation changed my life or the life of my folks in, in, in my hometown. I went to Beijing for college in, uh, in nine, 1986. Uh, at that time, for me to go to Beijing for my hometown, I first need to take a bus from my hometown to Wuhan, that's the capital city of the province. Uh, weather permits is going to be like six to eight hours, okay? Uh, and then I need to like, stand in line to buy train tickets. Two, three hours. And they have to stay overnight, find a place to stay overnight. And took the train next morning. That going to took me another 19 hours for me to get to Beijing. OK. Uh, and then from the Beijing station to the campus of Beijing University is another two, three hours, two, two hours at least. OK. 
Now, started I think about three, four years ago, we have a train from Beijing to my hometown, five hours. Uh, life totally, I mean, people's perception of the difference, of the distance between my hometown and Beijing totally transformed. It's only five hours. You can take the train, uh, particularly now you can take, we can people there take the train to capital city of Wuhan for an hour in the morning, do whatever they need to do, and they come back in the afternoon very comfortably. So, so this kind of transformation happened everywhere in China. My hometown is not, you know, coast area, it's not, you know, advanced, you know, really the, the places that you, you probably will hear from New York Times or anywhere. It's just on no one's map, but all, already transformation happened in my hometown. Okay, that's just the, the examples to, this is about Shenzhen, what I told you about, you know, what happened in my, in my hometown. Uh, really, some kind of economic and social transformation happened in China. How did it happen? Well, to put it short, I would say what happened in China is an entrepreneurial revolution. It is a triumph of the market. It's not state capitalism didn't make China what it is today. It's entrepreneurial revolution. It's the market. It's the private sector. I give you one. I'm really you know, I'm trying to convince you why that's the case. Um, in the book, we emphasized quite a bit the role played by the Chinese government, by Chinese leaders. Deng Xiaoping, for example. Is that name familiar, not familiar to any of you here? Deng Xiaoping? Okay. Deng Xiaoping was the guy, was the most important Chinese leader after Mao. He widely regarded as the, as the person responsible for what happened post during China in the past four decades. Uh, and in our book, we documented what Deng did to China. And Deng, what Deng did was to, you have to keep that in mind, you know, at the end of Mao's time, China was in terrible shape. China at that time, GDP per capita is about 100, 19 is the poorest countries in the whole world. Uh, and what Deng did was to change the game of the Chinese politics. Before, under Mao, everything, economic policy had to serve the cause of, 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 of communism, understood as state ownership and the central planning. Mao, not just Mao, a lot of communist leaders believed communism is the way to, say, fight poverty, to guide people to, you know, prosperity. And not only in communist countries, in the West, here in the States, in England as well, this idea that socialism works better than, cam than, than, than capitalism, the idea that the state works better than free enterprises, were quite common in the 60s, in the 70s, uh, thanks to I mean, Keynesian, the rise of Keynesian played some role there. Uh, we can uh, go into details during the Q&A uh, time. But that at one time, not long ago, people in socialist countries and the people in the West believed in the state. The, the, the wisdom of the state to cure what is called market failures. Okay? Uh, that, that, that was the way economics was taught then. And unfortunately, in a lot of places, that's still how economics is taught today. Uh, later on, I'm going to talk about you know, what's wrong with that. But at that time, going back to China, so Mao thought everything, all the economic policy should serve the cause of communism. Poverty itself is fine as long as China stays as a communist country. 
And poverty itself becomes glorious if that helps China to stay as a communist country. Now, Deng changed, changed that. Deng said poverty is not uh, uh, socialism. We, no, no one want desire poverty. You call it communism, you are not. So Deng said we're not going to call China socialism, we're not. With some other names, we have to modernize our economy. So at that time in China, use popular term used is economic modernization. And gradually changed to reform. But reform at that time was not to transform China from socialism to capitalism. No. Because at that time, even here in the West, people didn't have confidence in, social, in, the, in the, uh, capitalism. So what China thought, what they thought, and his generation of leaders thought, socialism didn't work under Mao. We have to, have, we have to find a better way to materialize socialism in China. And what they did was to give people some freedom, economic freedom, and to give local governments some freedom so that they can try different things. That's how private sectors started to rise in China. It started to rise when Beijing thought we didn't know what to do. So this is something new, right? Under Mao regime, Mao's policy didn't work. We had to find something new. And we, and, you know, capitalism didn't work as well in, China, in, in the West, so we need to find something, we need to find a third path, so to speak. Neither socialism nor capitalism. But the happy result was at the end of this long search, China ended up a market economy and a capitalist economy. So the whole, what happened in China is not a state-led program, far from it. Deng Xiaoping said in uh, early in 1985, uh, this is a, a conference, uh, he said what happened in, particularly in rural China is not something that we anticipated is totally out of blue. So if we go back and, 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 and see how Chinese government documented you know, what happened in China, we realize this is not something, something designed from above, but this is a bottom-up process. When people, when local officials had the freedom to try things out, and, and they can compete, they were forced to compete, and something out something good coming out of that, 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 that competition. Something totally un unanticipated. Uh, so this is the first question, how did China do it? China did it not because of state capitalism, not because of you know, Beijing designed some, something uh, 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 that you know, vigorously, vigorously implemented and then took China from socialism to, to capitalism. The Communist Party didn't have that intention. And it, you know, today is, China is still run by the by, by Communist Party. Right? They still identified itself, the, the term is socialism with Chinese characteristics. Right? They had no intention, still don't have any intention to get rid of socialism. So for China to become a market economy is not their intention, but it happened. Uh, and during Q and A, we can debate you know, how capitalistic China is today. Uh, this is question number one. Uh, yeah, we have already taken care of this. Question number two about Chinese capitalism, Chinese style. Uh, when we we started writing that book in two thousand eight. And uh, our book manuscript, we finished our book manuscript in about two years, and then, of course, sent out for, for reviews. And we get a lot of, a number of, of the reviewers criticizing us for what we did in our book. In the book, we said there's something wrong with the current Chinese system, with the market economy existing in China, which is China by that time had already developed a very competitive market for goods, but China still lacks a market for ideas. 
that diagnosis was still, I think, still relevant today. Uh, we got a lot of criticism from, you know, China experts because, you know, they don't think that's the main problem with China. They thought the big problem with China at that time was well, China was not a democracy. China didn't have, you know, multi-party competition. The Communist Party remains the only one, you know, monopolizing the political power and, and so on and so forth. So from their perspective, for China to move forward, the question should be asked is, when China going to democ democratize its, its political system? When China going to allow, you know, multi-party competition? And when China going to make follow the steps of Taiwan and South Korea? That's the kind of question people thought we should ask. Uh, and we happily, uh, we at that time had a lot of, really a lot of, face a lot of pressure. Uh, but, you know, gladly we be able to stick to our position and, uh, and say, this is not, we, we want to present a different picture of where China could be going. The problem is not necessarily with, you know, China didn't have democracy, but rather China didn't have a free market for ideas. And for, 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 for at least the two reasons. One, we emphasize the priority of the market for ideas is democracy cannot possibly work without a free market for ideas. People here, you know, I think, you are old enough to be able to vote, right? Could you imagine to have a, I, I know you have, you know, whether your candidates, your, your candidate won or, or, or lose, you have a lot of complaints about the, this election, right? But could you imagine Americans run the presidential election without free press? I mean, some people may go, say, go to the extreme, say, we may have a better system without a free press. Uh, but think hard. Do you think you, you are able to elect, to vote for the candidate, the right candidates, without being informed, you know, what he's going to do? Engaging in a public debate about, what, you know, what kind of values need America, should need America. What do we, what America as a country believes in? If you don't have that kind of national debate, you probably could still can vote, but the vote in that situation really doesn't make you a democracy. And we have a lot of, not a lot, we have some countries who allow people to vote every four years, but I would be very reluctant to call that democracy. So you need a free market for ideas in the first place to allow democracy to, to function. The second reason is democracy rests upon multi-party competition, right? This, today we take that for granted. But if you go back to Washington, the first president, at that time there, were, there was no political party to speak about in the U.S. And Washington himself was actually very, very skeptical about the role of political parties. And he would say that parties are going to corrupt political life. And if he were alive today, I'm, I'm not sure he would change his, his mind about, about, about political parties in general. And in China, China, of course, had, had a, a, a long history. But the party itself, but political parties didn't exist in China, hardly existed in China, ever. And this, the translation of the party into Chinese is called Dang. This is a Japanese translation, because China didn't have any equivalent to that in the past. And so Japanese, they were, of course, first exposed to you know, the Western system. So they, of course, you know, Japan used the Chinese uh, writing system. So they translated, they used the character Dang to translate the political party, party. And then the Chinese just later picked that, that up from Japan. But the party itself had a very strong 
connotation in Chinese context. And Dan, in Chinese language, is saying that form a party to pursue its own interests, that's terrible. That's going to corrupt the, uh, the political system. That's going to invite cronyism. That's going to, that's, but that's, that's what political parties do here in the West. That we form a political party to pursue its self-interest. But party itself, perceived per 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 this way, is widely criticized in Chinese political thoughts for, for thousands of years. So, in contrast, the market for ideas always, always appreciated by, by the Chinese leaders as the golden benchmark to judge a political regime. Of course, in reality, you know, the Chinese, over Chinese history, you know, China failed to, 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 to have that in practice free market for ideas. But that idea itself never disappeared, always cherished in China. So even now, probably no one in modern China did more harm to the market for ideas in China than Mao. But Mao had to praise the market for ideas. So that just as an indicator how entrenched that idea, market for ideas in China. So that's another reason we thought better, instead of emphasizing democracy or democratization, is better to emphasize the lack of free market for ideas. So the development, the implication is the development of a free market for ideas. That's the way to you know, push China forward, to move China toward a better, better country, economically, politically, culturally, so on and so forth. Um, so that's, that's our, our view of what's wrong with China. And, uh, uh, and of course, you know, we, we, the book came out in 2012, and so in the past few years, that concept, we're very pleased to see that concept, the market for ideas, has become quite popular in China, even the Chinese government now endorsed that concept. It's translated into Chinese, it's called uh, free, uh, market for ideas. Uh, if you, even People's Daily, that's of course the, the uh, newspaper coming out of the party and the controlled, by, controlled by the government, they endorse the market for ideas. Uh, and uh, because of internet, uh, at that time, of course, internet was already there, but we didn't really foresee how internet could transform Chinese media, at least. Uh, you uh, assume you have heard about Alibaba, you know, that's the use of internet to do trade. That really transformed, you know, Chinese commercial life. Uh, so, because of the, the, trans the, the, the internet uh, innovation, the market for ideas, in a way, developed faster than we could possibly, you know, foresee at that time. Uh, let's move on to, to the last question, what do we learn from China? Uh, the first the lesson is, the market works particularly when it is imperfect. Uh, I know we have most of you from econ, major, uh, econ majors, right? So I think in introductory economics, you must have exposed to the concept of perfect competition, right? Uh, market works under that situation. Otherwise, market fails because of you know, whatever reasons. There are a bunch of reasons. Informa information asymmetry and, and so on and so forth. I don't want to go into details. So the market works under a specific you know, conditions. Otherwise, we see market failure. That's what economics textbooks tell you about the market. In China, there's no perfect market, even today. Uh, the state still controls the land market, still very much monopolizes the financial market. Uh, 
Still on the process, still they are very dominant in, a, in the sectors where they stay. So there's no perfect market in China, but the market worked in China. Without the market forces, China would not become the second largest economy in the whole world within three, four decades. So the number one lesson is the market is much more resilient than textbook economics tells you about the market. I think we as economists do a terrible job educating the public about the market, about the economy. Uh, I'm going, this is uh, lesson number three, so I'm going to elaborate more later. Lesson number two, this is an old lesson, okay? Not, nothing new. Specialization and the trade. Uh, if we go back to Adam Smith, he would say, Division of labor and exchange. That's how that division of labor and exchange make a country productive, make a nation prosperous and at peace. And I would go a little bit further to say the level of division of labor and trade in a society measures the progress of civilization. The reason we are able to, you know, engage what we are engaging without, you know, catching a fish for our dinner because of specialization. We are able to come out of caves and jungles because of division of labor and the trade. China and Malta was no private trade. They, 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 all private, all markets were banned. That's why. China sucked so deep in, in poverty. And trade, freedom to consume for consumers, and freedom to supply for pro producers. That's the reason behind the economic rise of China. So coming to the very last one, we have to change the way we teach economics. And with that, about that, I had a good conversation with Steve this, this morning, this afternoon. And I just realized we had a huge task in front of us. That I give you one example why, why, why I see that. You know, may, you know, I'm not, I guess, qualified to make this, uh, uh, you know, such an over sweeping statement that economics ought to change. And I see this not because you know, economists or economists didn't predict you know, the, the 2008 financial crisis. Well, the economists didn't predict the economic rise of China. The market is so complicated, and we could not possibly foresee the outcome of market, transac of market transactions. So that's not the reason I'm not happy with economics. I'm not happy with economics because the economic textbooks cannot tell you, or you, can, you have not learned that trade is beneficial no matter what, whether you are a consumer, whether you are a producer. You will go to see your doctor, and the doctor tells you that, oh, you should ask your doctor, what can, what can stay fit, stay healthy? The doctor says, I heard that uh, you know, frequent exercise may do you some good. Fresh vegetables and the fresh fruits may do you some good. But I really don't know. They sometimes they work against you. You might think something wrong with this doctor. But in economics, that's the, exactly the kind of message you hear economists. Even economists, you know, recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee, tells you, yeah, trade works for you sometimes. Yeah, if you are a consumer, but if you are a producer, sorry, it may work against you. Let's go back to Paul Samuelson. This is the first American economist to win, to, to win the Nobel Prize. Anyone here familiar with the name Paul Samuelson? Uh, he's a, he's a, he, 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 transform, he changed the economics. Uh, for the worse. Uh, but he said, he made a point, I think, in the 1960s, 
um, someone asked him to give one, to give a, a principle, give some, to, to tell people some truth about economics. And he said the following, if there is any law in economics, it must be the law of comparative advantage. For people with some training in economics knows that that is about, about a trade, right? That is Ricardo's formalization of the inside first emphasized by, by uh, Adam Smith. Division of labor and exchange makes you rich, right? So even Sanderson appreciates the benefits of trade. But somehow, Sanderson, I think, misdirected economics to the wrong path for a lot of reasons. One reason is he thought anything not be able to put into math is not economics. So economists, the, pro, the whole profession followed, followed uh, Sanderson. And economists started to learn calculus and all other fancy technical stuff. They are good. I mean, you, they shouldn't learn. But for them to say that anything not be able to put into mathematics is not economics, that's terribly wrong. Um, I wish Samuelson knew something about mathematics after Kurt Gödel. He would have a better view, or he would recognize the limits of mathematics in conveying knowledge and the truth. Uh, but unfortunately, accounts today very much uh, preoccupied with what my mentor course called blackboard economics. Uh, anything that can put nicely on the blackboard, you know, that's either diagrams or formulas, regressions, you know, that's good economics. It's easy to teach uh, without really understanding what's going on in the economy. That's why economists are hard pressed when asked about, you know, give me any economic policy. What, what do we do here? And that's why people are very angry about, about economics and about the market economy itself. Uh, so I, I've been, I, I taught in, in, in the States and I also taught in China. I've, something maybe is shocking to me in the, at the beginning that it's easier to convince the Chinese students that the market works. I had a harder time convince the American students that the free trade works. Uh, later I recognized you know, the Chinese students just because of their experience or the experience of their parents, they know the market works better. Better than any benevolent market or benevolent state. Uh, here, I mean, we have been in, living in you know, this free economy for so long, we sometimes lost the big picture, how important the market is. Uh, why don't I stop here and uh, be happy to take any questions from the audience. There's microphones on both sides if you have questions. Stand up for the microphone. You will answer. And what have the results been? Good, good, good question. Um, instead of China, I will give you some examples from, from Japan. Uh, I was in Japan last summer for about three and a half months and was able to tour the country a little bit. Uh, I think Japan does a better job than both China and the US in terms of educating 
the labor force, what work is. Uh, by which I mean, here we have minimum wage, right? We think you, your value as a worker is measured by how much you are paid. Um, and of course, I mean, economists have made a lot of theories saying, you know, you have, what's the marginal theory of distribution, whatever that is, uh, tells you your contribution to the economy uh, is largely what the, the bo your boss is willing to pay you for your work. Uh, this has, and I'm not saying this is a terrible practice. It has its, uh, you know, its value, but somehow it devalues the work itself. It simplifies your work. It, how to say it? it? It reduces your work itself. It just measures all, whatever you do on this monetary value. And uh, whether you value the, the, the job itself how much you enjoy yourself does not matter. It's only what matters only is your job, your, your salary relative to your peers. Uh, and you know, this is, of course, this, you know, capitalism is about making money. And there's nothing wrong you know, with that practice per se, but I think there's some damage done because of that practice to our perception of, the wor of work. In Japan, it's different. Japan, of course, Japan is a, is a small country and a very close society. They have the value that even you are a garbage collector, your job is valued by the society because you keep society clean. It's not how much you paid. And you recognize your contribution to the society is recognized by what you do to the society. In many ways, not just by what you paid. Uh, so in Japan, workers, they very much get enjoyment. They enjoy what they do. And they, their contribution is recognized in many other ways other than you know, money, uh, uh, the, the, the wages they, they take home. Uh, China somehow, I think, uh, is, is, I think is in between US and, and Japan. Uh, I hope China can move on that, in that regard, moving closer to Japan to have people recognize the, the value of the work itself. It's just other than monetary rewards. Sorry I said too much, but this, the, question you asked, you, the question you asked is so deep, and I think uh, requires a lot of uh, efforts for you know, particularly academics and also policymakers to think about, you know, how we organize our work in such a way that the people find fulfillment in the job itself. The phrase uh, market for ideas is a very interesting idea and it's a, certainly a very powerful metaphor. Can you say a few words about what a market for ideas would look like in China if it were to emerge? Thank you. Um, the market for ideas, uh, I'm still learning about that concept, what it really means. Um, in our book, we basically put the market for ideas as another like, fact market. So we have capital for labor. We have capital, so we have market for labor. We have market for capital. Why don't we have market for ideas because our modern economy has become more and more knowledge driven, right? If knowledge has become such a powerful force in the economy, and when we, we have, you know, we have developed a market for capital, for labor, why don't we have a market for ideas? That's what we presented in our book. But over the past few years, we recognized knowledge is quite different from other factors of production. And the market for ideas is going to be quite different from, say, a market for labor, a market for capital. Uh, and right now, uh, you know, 
have been reading uh, uh, Popper, Carl Popper. I hope this is the name you guys are familiar with, even you. Okay. He, I think he has a lot of penetrating analysis of the role of knowledge in society. And he, of course, very much uh, arguing for a, pre, uh, a market for ideas. Of course, he didn't use the term, he used critical rationalism. That the debate, that uh, dialogue, uh, that you know, the cache of ideas, that's the term he used. That's how we gain knowledge, how we come nearer to truth, but never be able to possess truth. Uh, so I imagine the market for ideas, at least, as to, you know, given uh, conditioned by my current understanding, is at least China need to have you know free press. I uh, need to have private universities. Today we know the university everywhere has become the dominant place where new ideas, where knowledge is produced. Uh, China doesn't have really private universities. Uh, I'm not, not, nothing wrong about public universities, okay? As long as we compete, we are forced to compete with private universities. Uh, and that's why we have the best higher education in the world here. Not because we have, you know, great, I don't know, Berkeley or Michigan or even Harvard. It's because competition makes us stronger, makes us better. Competition eliminates those that fails to deliver what they promise, right? So, so this is the basic condition to allow a free market for ideas. You have the freedom to think to, express, to say, to write down what you have in mind, to communicate with people who are willing to debate with you, to hear what you have in mind, and you have a place, be able to train, be able to educate the next generation of, of citizens. You know, how does society work, what is the market, what is the state, what should they do, and so on and so forth. Um, China, I think, has made a lot of progress in that, to that, in that direction, but China still has a long way to go. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about how corruption in the Chinese government inhibits economic growth within China. Thank you. Good question. China actually, the, the perception of corruption in China uh, and its, its impact on the economy actually changed quite dramatically. In the early decades of reform, particularly in the 80s and the 90s, a lot of people thought corruption is good for economic growth. Because at that time, China still had a lot of bad laws, bad regulations, and corruption is the way for you to circumvent those bad regulations. So for example, I'll give you one example. In the 80s, private enterprise, very hard for them to just get registered. Because you know, at that time, in China still, this part of the Chinese Communist Party still believed in socialism, which thought you know, state enterprise or public enterprise, that should be the major player in the economy. So a lot of discrimination against the private enterprise. So for a private enterprise to get start, to start their business, you have to register as uh, some collective enterprise, like village and the township enterprise. Uh, and then we have to pay a small fee to, to, to do that. So this is a kind of you know, corruption. But that corruption allows the private sector to be able to, to, to rise and develop. Today, of course, more and more people recognize corruption is a way for politicians to trade power for money. And uh, uh, you know, after Xi Jinping took power two years, three years ago, and a lot of even high position officials got arrested for corruption. Uh, so people now realized, and even before that, of course, realized corruption is a big problem for any country to say, to believe in rule of law, believe in justice, 
believe in you know, all the good values that we identify ourselves with. Uh, but corruption is inevitable as long as you have power, right? And uh, I, we don't need to go to China to study corruption. Uh, we have plenty of examples. You know, when I was at Chicago, you know, the, the governors of Illinois, several of them got, uh, you know, ended up in, in prison. Um, so th this is not a Chinese problem. It's a human problem. With, with power, with limited power, we are bound to have corruption. Okay. So I want to thank you for coming. Thank all of you for coming. Here's a really good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.